Hello, how are you? Well, for those of you that aren't aware, Sarah and I, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, will be celebrating 20 years of marriage. And of course, it's been total harmony all the way with not a disagreement in sight, isn't it? Whatever you say. Yes, dear. Mm. Well, the reality is disagreements do happen. <laughs> and uh, disagreements happen in our life, in our marriage, in our church, in our society. Mm -hmm. And these are painful at times. Yeah. Uh, they can lead to maybe to long-lasting um, and deep-rooted hurt and broken relationships. And I wonder today, we're asking the question about, can we disagree well? Mm -hmm. Can we disagree well? Is that an oxymoron, which is a bit of a strange word, but is it this idea that they can, that can be something that's achievable? Um, so are you good at dealing with conflict and with disagreements? And I guess we're all different with that, aren't we? Yeah, I think some people face them head on and go straight in there and, you know, are quite happy to have an argument or to have a strong disagreement or a strong debate and other people would shy completely the other way and just retreat from that and do anything to avoid any kind of conflict whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. And so to help us, for those of you who have been journeying with us, we're looking at the book of Acts and this is the early church just as they're starting to find out what it means to be followers of Jesus after his death. And uh, they're navigating this new landscape. And here we find in chapter 15 that there's a disagreement and we can maybe learn some patterns from, uh, from what happens within that situation. So if we move to the start of Acts, Acts chapter 15, 1 to 2, we'll just see what, uh, what it says in that scripture. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. So the reality is, in our 16 years of officership, there's been times when there's been disagreement yes. uh, amongst our those that have been part of our, our church. There's been disagreement between the leadership team. There's been disagreement between us, even on the way that we should go. And uh, I, I guess one of the things that we haven't, had to disagree or have too much discussion on is around circumcision. So today we're not going to deal with the issue uh, at, at the crux of this disagreement we see in Acts 15. What we're going to look at is the principles of how the church dealt with the fact that they couldn't agree mm. on a certain situation. So what was the response? What do we learn today? Well, firstly, if we uh, look at the response, we see that there wasn't it was made public, as Sarah's just read, uh, uh, that this disagreement happened, but we didn't then see fighting or gossip. What they decided to do instead was to discuss and pray about the situation because they wanted to deal with it, but do it in a godly mm. manner. And so if we continue to read on through verses two to four, we'll see what they did. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. Thank you. And so we would argue that that response is probably countercultural to what we experience today. Um, it's a new way of acting in this new landscape of, of building this community together as the early church. Mm. Now, you only have to look at things like social media, don't you, or even the news and even things like our party politics to see that we don't always disagree well mm. and the way that we portray ourselves and the way that we respond isn't always uh, in a way which is certainly as outlined here in Acts 15 uh, with maybe people not wanting to back down from their position and hold on even firmer. So if we carry on through Acts 15, we'll see a bit more about how this church modelled this practice of uh, discussion of prayer and giving all sides a respectful hearing mm. to their position. 
Do you want to just outline what that would be, Sarah, what they said? So reading on from verses 5 to 12. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Okay, so we see there a willingness to hear both sides. Now I wonder, you know, do we often see that? I think in my experience I've seen a lot of people that are so set on their frame of mind and their belief that whenever they're in discussion or argument about that, they're not listening to the other person. They're always thinking about what they're going to say next to get their point across. Mm -hmm. So rather than listening to both points of view, I've seen that people would be quite quick to just keep on the track of their own viewpoint rather than listen and counteract in that way. And that can be very dangerous because you're not then willing to step back a little bit from your own viewpoint mm -hmm. and be able to accept someone else's point of view or even give a reasoned argument. You're just going bombardment in with your with your own view okay and so we learn as we as we go through that uh, from each other and we learn the, uh, maybe a little bit more about someone else's position and our willingness to to change our own position possibly um, in in that process and so I guess we could argue well that that could be a you know a good skill for life in general um, what does that mean for us as a church and for those of us who follow Jesus well if we remember back at the start of the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people. And this, and the scripture says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now within us. When we see the miracles and wonders that the, uh, the apostles in the early church did, it was done in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't lead us when we come to a situation where we might find ourselves in disagreement with each other. And um, what it does there is it comes as a comforter and a guide and it's those promptings. It's like, uh, I don't know if you can think of that cartoon where you have the little kind of people on your shoulders saying in your ear, what about this, what about that? And in some ways, the Holy Spirit helps us to, to listen well and to hear from other people and discern in our hearts the leading of the Spirit as to mm. what to do and where to go next. And so there needs to be, in a, whereas, as, if we disagree well, an openness to the Holy Spirit to lead us and to help us um, just to listen on our own without the Holy Spirit is, isn't as easy but when we allow the Holy Spirit to speak into us uh, then uh, then that can make all the difference. I think also the Holy Spirit gives us grace as well to mm. be able to accept that perhaps we are not 100% correct in our thinking either and that there might actually be margins for growth in our own thinking and development of our own ideas by listening to the other side as well. So mm. that grace to uh, acknowledge that we're not always right yeah. is really important because some it's not that you have to back down, but sometimes you need to reformulate your own ideas to say, well, actually I did think this, but having listened to what that person is saying, I'm now starting to rethink my position on that mm. and rethink what I feel about that. Or if you're still really, um, stuck on your principles and you know that what you believe is right and you're firm on that it's having the grace to disagree in a polite way rather than being dogmatic in that and so mm. that grace in either situation there that I've outlined it enables us to either disagree well or to reformulate our own ideas and those are both important points when you're dealing with conflict or arguments or potential disagreements in the church, in families, or in work, or wherever you happen to be. Yeah, 
is using yeah. that use of grace. Definitely. Now, one of the things which is key about this disagreement is that it wasn't done in isolation. It was done very much with the, the wider church and particularly the church elders back in Jerusalem. And here is a good model that sometimes mm. if we find ourselves in disagreement, then to find somebody that we trust, that we mutually trust, that we can go to for that yeah. support and for the, can you help us just work this through together uh, is, is really good. And for us, within a church setting, we have you know, wise and faithful people and we have church leadership who maybe that those discussions mm. and conflict can come to for us to deliberate over and think through. And so what we see then is once this discussion has gone on, there's been listening, there's been the leading of the Holy Spirit, there then needs to be an acceptance of any decisions that are made, particularly if that's by leaders. If you've gone to leaders for for that decision and that decision's given, then we see an agreement made. And do you just want to read Acts 15, 19 there? And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so in, the, in all of the argument that's made, ultimately, this is the crux. We want to see people come to faith. Mm. That's, that's what the early church wanted to do. They wanted to follow that uh, command by Jesus to go and make disciples uh, of all nations. And they're doing that. And so the church is having to think, well, hold on, if we're going to be making disciples of all nations, then that's the most important thing. Everything up is mm. every, everything else is up for negotiation almost um, yeah. in, in how we get there. But the ultimate thing is, are people turned to God? Yes, right. Well, that is the answer to the question. And so do you think there's situations where... Or, or what, what do you think the benefits are listening to that wisdom of, of leaders and accepting that decision? Well, I think it helps you to get back to what the ultimate vision statement is. So whether it's a church and you have a main mission statement or a vision of what that church is about, whether it's work and you're trying, you know, you know what your baseline is for work, what the company's vision statement is and what it is you were trying to achieve. If it's your marriage, what is the purpose of that marriage? And so when you have these disagreements, you need sometimes somebody or for yourselves to come back to that baseline of, well, what is it we're trying to achieve here mm. and what needs to be let go of and held lightly and what needs to be adhered to. And so with the, in this situation, when they were thinking about that, the main point of what they were doing was to spread the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of his salvation for all mm. was the most important thing. Yeah. The semantics of whether or not Gentiles had to convert to Jesus Judaism by circumcision or not was then irrelevant to the fact that actually Gentiles could be saved regardless of that conversion which we mm. looked at a few weeks ago when I looked at yes. Peter and Cornelius yeah. and so I think you know they came down to that conclusion that it's all about salvation and all about people coming to faith mm. rather than should it be this way that way or the other mm. and in, in churches we see lots of arguments about what color chairs it should be or should we wear uniform or not uniform or should we do baptism this way or should we do it that way and all of those things are irrelevant compared to what the ma main mission of a church mm. is which is to share the good news of the gospel of jesus christ so i think when you come down to that and sometimes when you're hot in when you're the parties that are disagreeing you're so blinkered mm. that you do need an outside person a neutral person sometimes to come in and mm. help mediate between that it's very important to note as well though when you were saying that earlier i was just thinking you don't want to get to a point where this person is gathering people around them who are like-minded and going to support their argument mm. and that person's gathering equal you know that then becomes a huge them and us kind of situation it's very important that wisdom is exercised in this as well as the grace I was talking about earlier. Yeah. And then I think one of the key things here is that the the early church allowed the disagreement to happen and work through it. Yeah. And we can certainly testify to the the fruit of having robust conversation around issues, decisions, because when we come to a decision then we come to it much stronger and much more united. And so uh, Sometimes we can shy away, as Sarah said earlier, from the conflict. Mm. But we would say it's actually healthy not to just be yes people, but to, to challenge, to uh, have conversation. But we do it in love and in grace and with the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And this, that's what this passage shows us. Now, we could sort of end it there 
and it all sounds wonderful. That uh, We all know how to disagree now. We all know how to disagree <laughs> and everything finishes off absolutely rosy, roll the credits of Disney and, and everything's fine. But if we read on uh, to the end of the passage into verses 39 and 40, we see uh, that, it's, uh, that it's not um, quite the, fi- the, the harmonious uh, time for everybody and uh, there are still times when disagreement comes and it doesn't always resolve itself in a nice, comfortable manner. Yes, yeah, so although they might have managed to get to the agreement of all Gentiles can be saved as well as Jews, mm. then um, we see that two people that had been going around spreading the good news of the gospel decided to part company as they were unable to agree on a completely different issue. And so here we have, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. And their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. So this is quite sad, isn't it? That yeah. two people who have been going around involved in ministry together for so long decided that the actual the best thing for them to do is to separate but there's a reality about that that sometimes we don't always get a resolution that Mm. we that we agree on the outcome of what we should do but it's how we disagree is a marker of us as people of God and even with Paul and Barnabas we see actually they their their heart was still to expand the gospel and the good news in the church Mm. And they realised the best way they could do that was to put aside their personal differences and, and, and you go that way and do it, you know, tell those group of people, I'll go this way and tell these group of people. So in fact, that disagreement and that separation led to an even greater expansion mm. of the church of God. And again, as church leaders, we've there have been times in our ministry where the best thing for somebody to do is actually be blessed to leave our fellowship, to join another fellowship, where they might just be able to experience God and connect at their level or in a different way, not saying that one's right and one's wrong, it's just finding the best fit for us to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Mm. And that's why there's diversity in the church, because it's not a one-size-fits-all, is it? Yeah, we're not all the same. We don't all think the same or have the same needs or the same way in which we connect with God, and so it's important for people to find that place for them. And so in any time when people have decided to leave our fellowship, we've always made sure that they've left well. We've blessed them on their way. Mm. There's been no ill feeling or, or any rut between us. But it's been a way of saying, how can we best support you in finding a place where you are going to grow as, as, a, as a disciple of Jesus? Mm. And so sometimes there will be times when we don't get a resolution and everything stays together. And parting is sometimes the way that needs to to go. But we see that God works through that just as much as the times when we're able to resolve and stay together, which would be our first hope, but the reality is that's not always Mm. the case. And so today we we just conclude our thoughts by uh, really sort of recognising that the Bible doesn't hold its punches. It doesn't just present a sugar-coated version of life, but presents a reality of conflict, of disagreement, of us not all thinking the same, but presents a model for how we can work that through. So we avoid fighting, we avoid gossiping about what somebody else has said or thought or done. We we stop to discuss and we pray. Mm. We give space to listen to the other side and, and allow the Holy Spirit's prompting in our lives. And if we've gone to others for for wisdom, and we've gone to our leaders maybe for wisdom, then we need to accept and humble ourselves to that decision that's been made on our behalf once they've listened to those situations. And if sadly we get to a point where we we have to agree to disagree, but we still sit uncomfortably, then maybe parting is is the most helpful thing for us to do, to even maintain that relationship. And sometimes Mm. being apart is, we have a stronger relationship bizarrely, than if we're we're with each other all the time. And so the challenge here, I guess, is that we're up up for fighting for the faith. 
the Salvation Army we're into fighting for things, fighting against injustice, but we're fighting for the faith. But this doesn't mean that we end up fighting each other, mm. fighting the faithful. And so uh, as we conclude, let us just pray that as disagreements come and we experience them, we look to the early church as a model of how to resolve them. And we ask for the Holy Spirit's prompting in our lives as we do so. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for the account in Acts chapter 15. We welcome the honesty of the events and the wisdom of the early church leaders. Thank you for the lessons we can learn about dealing with conflict. Forgive us when we have not handled disagreement well, either on a personal level or as a church. May we be open to the Holy Spirit in discerning the resolution to conflict. Father, as disagreements in our lives arise, as they will, may we respond in a way which glorifies you and demonstrates your character of grace and integrity. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's been good to share with you this morning. We'd love to hear from you uh, in these days as we're unable to meet you face to face. And uh, we just pray blessing upon you and protection over you in these days. Amen.